Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jody Detchen. I'm one of the managing partners of Orange Grove Consulting and a professor of management at Suffolk University in downtown Boston, Massachusetts. My co-partner at Orange Grove Consulting, Kelly Watson, and I, along with our team of trainers and consultants, help people see new perspectives in order to more effectively hire, promote, and sustain women into leadership roles. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss Orange Grove Consulting's approach to getting more women into leadership. I will cover what the problem is today, how we solve it, and discuss some of the benefits of increasing women in positions of leadership. My intention is to introduce you to some of the opportunities for your organization. In order to figure out where we're going, a good place to start is where we've come from. So we know what this looks like. It's Mad Men. We've all seen it. We've seen it a lot. How in the world do we move beyond? Well, it's not just about recruiting. When we look at the picture, it's still less than 15% of women at the top. And in many industries outside of tech and engineering, women make up 50% of the entering class. But we have a big fallout though in the middle. We need to think about the whole talent pipeline from entry through to the executive level. I was at a talk recently and they were noting how we need to get women into the job in the pipeline, jobs where people get picked for the promotions, like project management. But when we look at the top, less than 20% women, and there's a 35% gap. We use this as our guidepost statistic for the purpose of this presentation. There's an assumption, though, that if we wait, time will fix this problem. But at this pace, according to estimates by McKinsey, it's going to take us 100 years for it to change. This is not your daughter's life. This is not your granddaughter's life. This is not even your great, great granddaughter's life. A hundred years. Just imagine for a minute what this means. So two things that I want to do on this slide. There's a lot of statistics here. But I want to call you to action and act quickly. I'm not depressing you on purpose here. There's a lot of statistics that tell us that women are not holding up to the talent pipeline. I want to focus on just a few of them. Remember, we're focused on how to get women into leadership. So if we start with the premise that it takes us 100 years to get to parity, what, does the, what do these statistics tell us? So first, let's look at the bottom left. For every 100 men moving into leadership, only 79 women are moving in. Now, every industry is different, we're talk, but we're talking here about senior managers to director level and VP level. Now, let's think, think about this further. We're trying to get to figure out what the gap is. So we could ask, are women more qualified? Well, people have done research on this. At the bottom, we're tested in 16 leadership characteristics. Women are equal or outperform men in 15 out of 16 of these characteristics. So we know they're capable. How do we account for this severe leadership gap? We also know that waiting, waiting won't work. Everyone thinks it's changing with the millennials, yet tech is bottom. Heavy with young people and lower percentage than when I personally was in technology. It's more male dominated than ever. And when we look at whose career takes precedence in the upper right for millennials, the difference between millennial women and men is almost double. It's affecting the pipeline now. So let's figure it out. Why do we care about this 35% gap at the executive level? Well, we care because it affects companies' ability to compete. We care because McKinsey and others have consistently found that organizations with diverse leadership perform better financially. We also know that organizations who are less homogenous are more innovative. Heterogeneity creates innovation. Clearly aligning with customer demographic also matters to how the customer is managed and viewed, the type of products they offer, the services. We also know from Weber Shandwick and others that role modeling matters. When women see a woman up in the top, it, they, may, they then believe it's possible. It makes younger women feel like they have a feasible path to power. So we know that there are benefits for everyone. So let's figure out how to do it. Now, I want you to think about this. If you're listening to this presentation, you are already seeing this, or you want to figure this out. Clearly, you already understand that this is a competitive opportunity for your company. The real opportunity that is if the status quo is going to bring us to 50, 50, and 100 years, Imagine if you start to change your behavior now. Imagine how you might accelerate that. Because those companies that are able to get beyond the status quo now in their competitive search for talent, imagine how they're going to compete. 
I'll give you an example. I'm on a nonprofit board called Westorg, which works with women in tech and bio in Boston. So I was talking with a woman from Biogen, and they had just hired a woman who specifically sought out Biogen precisely because they have a reputation for putting women into leadership. She was highly talented, and Biogen handily won that talent war. Particularly where talent is competitive, you're going to compete. For example, tech has an entry problem. So if you're in a tech organization, being that organization who fosters female talent is going to attract more women. At an event that I was at, a senior global head of our research and development talked about how she's created these female-friendly research labs, and she easily gets to 30% women because all the good women want to work there. She's created the environment, and the women show up. She outcompetes her competitors because she's winning a talent war. You have an opportunity to be inventive, innovative and get more talent across the board. So this isn't a $20 million IT investment. To a great extent, it's about changing our perspective, our mindset, our processes. It's fundamentally about changing our viewpoint and then creating the supporting structures that reinforce that perspective. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what that means. So there are companies today that are including women into leadership in your industry. If you look around, you're going to find out who they are. You have the chance to leave the pack and leave them behind. Who do you want to be? We conducted a two-year study where we interviewed college-educated women about their careers. We learned a couple of things. First off, college-educated women we chose because we assumed that if they went to college, it was because they wanted a career. That someone once told them they could be anything they wanted to be, and they were pursuing that ambition. Secondly, our original plan was to find out how regular women were managed to balance work and life, because we know that sharing stories which is what gives each of us permission to try new things. It can be really depressing to hear how the rock star women do things. In fact, what we heard from a lot of women is that it's demoralizing. They didn't believe that they could, they could actually achieve it. Women find it refreshing to talk about their careers. What we, a lot of women told us at the end of the interviews was that nobody had asked them about their careers before. And so it was strange to have a space where it was okay to feel good about their careers for a bit. For a bit. We found three major things from our study. First off, women demonstrated career ambivalence. They felt they could only have a career at the sacrifice of life or vice versa. This was different from men who, who we also are studying who are expected to have a career. So little girl, you can be anything you want after you take care of your first job, which is mommy. You get to have a career like it's a prize. But first you have to be a great mom or a great sister or a daughter or a friend. And if you want to be the career lady, then you need to sacrifice the family part. It's either or, not both. This is the unspoken rule that no one is talking about and why most workplace pro programs focused on women are actually focused on motherhood. The second thing we found is that women had different degrees of role disconnect. So the larger the conflict or gap between what they believed in terms of their various roles, the larger the gap in this congruency, the less primed women were for success. And we know this plays a role in performance. So you should consider two math tests given to women. On one, the women were first asked questions that reminded them they were from a brand name school in the Northeast and were very successful. On the other, the women were asked about their gender, their race, and reminded about work-life balance. The second group performed significantly less well on the same exact test. Gender, role, disconnect, impacts performance. The third thing we found was unconscious bias. And we all have unconscious biases about others. But what we discovered is that women have unconscious biases about themselves as well, and these are based on gender. And while we can't do anything about the unconscious biases people have about us, we could absolutely work on the ones that we carry around about ourselves. We can train women to negotiate, for example, but until we remove the deep-seated belief that they are not truly equal or don't truly deserve a seat at the table, all of the skills training in the world won't make them negotiate better for themselves. So underneath it all is a self-limiting belief system. Women should, quote-unquote, do it all. They should look good. They should be nice. But unfortunately, this backfires when it comes to our careers. So what are we talking about for unconscious bias? Here's where it shows up. I can't apply for the job unless I meet the job requirements. I need to step back from my career to prioritize my family. I'm too busy to network or take on new projects. What we find is that women typically wait until they deem themselves 100% ready for the requirements of the job before applying. But men, 
they wait till they're 60%. And women take the job description literally. If it says that I have to have X, Y, and Z experience and I don't have it, I can't apply. But think about what the organization assumes on the other side. Few women are applying, so there must not be any qualified ex candidates. All a bunch of assumptions. If we think about family as just one of the factors affecting retention, but the organization's response can often re reinforce these by reminding women all day long that they should really be focused on job one, women hold back and don't want the next job because it might take them away from their family responsibilities. Another is pay equity. Women leave jobs for jobs with more money, but often they're making, still making far less money than their male counterparts for the exact same job in the company. One woman last week was promoted to manager, and suddenly she could see what everyone on her team was making. A man on her team was making twice what she was as the manager. Twice. It was a six-figure difference. Okay, he asked, and she didn't. So that tells us he's better at self-promotion than she is. But is self-promotion really the skill we should be overemphasizing? Is that what makes someone a more valuable employee? Now, women often make themselves indispensable at work, assuming that doing it all means doing it all by myself. They keep their heads down, they check biases, boxes, and hope someone will notice. What does the organization see? Someone indispensable, someone I need, but not someone who could be strategic. Someone who could do the tactical work, but not someone who could lead. And women also tend to migrate to departments and roles where there are other women or where other women have come before them. So we see a predominance of women in marketing and HR. But when the organization seeks a president, they want someone with P&L experience, international assignments, finance. Again, we have a disconnect. So at Orange Grove, we don't just team people to see this unconscious bias in action. Because what ends up happening is stopping there leaves people feel like, wow, look at this. It's horrible. I can't really control it. They just think, oh, that's just the way things are. And they don't feel like they have any agency in making the change. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can change the way we think and respond. And so we provide a model for real behavioral change. And it's backed up by research in cognitive behavior therapy, in influence, and even the science behind advertising. So first, we teach people how to suss out these biases from their language, from their behaviors. We get underneath to find out why we respond this way. And whenever there's guilt or tension, we teach people to pause and reflect. Then we get people to identify and examine their underlying assumptions. What rule am I following? Is it right for me? Do I agree? We pick them up. We can look at them from all different angles. If we agree, great, go forward. If we don't agree, then we get to reframe. We get to rewrite the rules for us based on our own values, not somebody else's dictates. We found that you can't unring the bell. Once you know you've made a decision based on a flawed assumption, it's really hard to keep responding the next way, the same way. Either way, now your choice is conscious. So let's look at a couple of examples. I'm doing great for the level of experience that I am. I can stretch and learn new things. The organization can say, I can be proactive. I can seek out talented women to join our team. For retention, my spouse and I can both have great careers and we can both take responsibility for our family. Organization can say, hey, we provide, uh, we offer paid family leave and flexible work so all of our employees can balance work and life. For promotion, we can say, you know what, I need to step out of the weeds, delegate and be more strategic. And an organization can say, hey, I can think more broadly about what skills are required. And so by reframing, what ends up happening is new opportunities arise. The limits come off. And women tell us consistently that opportunities open up. So you can see the benefits of closing that 35% gap. How can it be done? Well, the way it needs to be done is we need to work with both women on their unconscious bias, and we need to work with the organization. We do this by working with both women and organizations. But step one is we start with the women to get the most immediate results. And because shifting our perspective in any organizational change, you need to do it with the new mindset, not the old one. So for example, by shifting women's assumptions that they are the only ones responsible for childcare to a reframe that both are responsible means that your female employees aren't the only ones taking the kids to the doctor. And the organization can shift, for example, by creating maternity and paternity leave because both parents are responsible for caring for the child. And paternity leave has a positive impact on women's roles at home that last into teenagehood. 
But it's essential that work here not simply focus on training. It also has to bring in accountability and implementation. Changing these ingrained behaviors takes time and reinforcement and group accountability. In other words, people have to implement what they've learned with new habits. So we suggest starting with the women first because they're the only ones who can control their own behaviors. No one can control someone else. We can only influence. But when women change and truly embed these changes, they then change the organization around them. And at Orange Grove, our core belief and the missing link that we found is that bias, women have biases about themselves. Companies who invest in helping women with this will open up the pipeline. So how does this reframe help? Well, what we've seen from the women that we've worked with in our workshops is that women feel, over 75% feel like there are more possibilities. 60% feel empowered. They're motivated. They love what they're doing. They figure out, oh my God, I do have more opportunity. And so this means they're open to their potential, opportunities, they're more understanding, they're more aware of their capabilities, and you get talent that wants to move up. Cool stuff happens. But we can't stop there. We also must also change the unconscious bias of men and managers so that they can see their own gender biases inherent in their daily work. We also need to change the environment. If we just change perspective without changing the environment, it's like an addict. We turn into the same situation. We've got to adapt the organizational aspects so that the new behavior is reinforced and rewarded. We need to make these organizational changes across the talent pipeline. It's not enough to focus simply on recruiting. We need to address it at retention, promotion, and hierarchical levels. It's about identifying the unconscious biases and then implementing these reframes across the process, including the culture. The key is to assess so you know where the problem is. Because otherwise, organizations are throwing a lot of money at the wall but not measuring or understanding where the problem is. So we've developed an assessment that looks at key indicators across all three hierarchical levels, including pay and recruitment. We've shown you part of it here on this slide. For example, as I mentioned previously about the manager with the team member making twice what she was making, we need to find these problems. That discrepancy was hidden until the manager found it. It wasn't his fault. The system for giving him more money was informally based. But until it's identified, until these hidden biases that are embedded within the organization are identified, you cannot fix it. Some people have a problem with recruitment, others do not. So we take a systematic approach. You need to be smart, specific, directed. You want 200 women in a year in new positions? You've got to be very specific about where to make the changes. It's a mathematical equation. So we can be systematic about it. Currently, the men raise their hands and the women don't. You're having getting a hard time getting women to apply, but you have to go after them and be more proactive about looking people for people in that role. But you can also change the criteria. Usually, a promotion request has a list of required skill sets. The men look at the list and say, as we've heard, I've got most of those. The women look at the list and say, I have some, so I'm not ready. So instead, the list could say simply, we're looking for a candidate with 60% of those. Then when you get the candidate list, instead of comparing each candidate with the idea, which introduces bias, we compare the candidates across each other, which enables us to comparatively evaluate the skill set, like in a table, so we can make skills and capability trade-offs and prioritize what it is we want. Or let's go back to the man making double. If we were to look at the company with our scorecard, perhaps we are determining who gets a raise based on who asks, meaning that we're skewing the results towards people who have a lot of gumption. Is that actually correlated with success? Perhaps in some roles like sales, but in others, it's not likely. We are overemphasizing promotions and raises that someone has asked for rather than the skills we are looking for in the job. Instead, we can examine the processes behind these raises. Maybe we say something like, when one person asks, we evaluate everyone to determine what's required. Maybe we evaluate on a regular basis to identify these problems, these discrepancies early. If companies are pushing women into a senior level position but the women are pushing back, we can help with that by going back to the reframe. We can help everyone see the underlying assumptions and test them. We can start to look for where changes occur. So for example, when you get 30% of women or minorities in a group, you start to change the group norm. Then you start to question whether work needs to be done this way, and you start to get changed. For example, one team met every day at 8.30 for their team meeting. It was sacrosanct. Miss it, and you're considered not a team player. So one woman came late one day because she had a childcare issue. She was yelled at, and she immediately reacted by thinking, oh, man, 
I guess I'm going to have to look for another job. So first, of course, we must help her think differently about her situation. But then another person on the team asked, hey, what's the big deal? She was late. Who cares? Why don't we just meet at 9 anyway? There were two changes there. First, we had to change her mindset. But then we had to change the rule about when the meeting starts. So to recap, it's going to take 100 years, 100 years to fill that 35% gap. 100 years of less than optimal effectiveness and competitiveness. And remember, this isn't a $20 million IT investment. This is a process change project that enables you to fundamentally shift perspectives so that you not only get a diverse talent pool, you outcompete everyone else, attract and keep the best talent, and you end up with a happy, healthy organization. The way we at Orange Grove approach it is to start with the women and then help them reframe and then assess the company with a scorecard and then help the, the organization reframe and make the process changes that embed these. Together, we can make these changes. So at Orange Grove, we would love to help your organization. If you found this information helpful and feel it aligns with your goals, you can find more information at orangegroveconsulting.com.